Thank you, Dean George, students and faculty and staff here at Beeson Divinity School. It is so good to be with people who have taught me so much, some of you from close range and some of you from far away, and it is such a pleasure and an honor for me to be with you today in the name of the Lord. American Christians, seems to me, tend to veer back and forth between a kind of hand-wringing pessimism and a fist-pumping triumphalism. And nowhere is that more clearly seen than in the questions that come up over the issues that we will be talking about this morning, love and lust and the sanctity of human life. On the question, for instance, of advocacy for the unborn and the pro-life cause, there are many who would despair at different points in American history, but then there are also those who would look at survey polls that would suggest that the majority of Americans are pro-life or the majority of younger Americans identify themselves as pro-life. And they will speak of this data in order to say, see, we're winning. We are winning the cause of life. I'm not so sure. Because when it comes to identifying oneself as pro-life, there's much more involved than simply a tribal identification. Because abortion, after all, is not just another choice. It's not something usually that someone chooses ahead of time. Instead, it seems that a feminist leader several years ago was accurate when she said that most Americans are pro-life with three exceptions, rape, incest, and my situation. It seems that for many people, the question of the value and the sanctity of human life can be abstract and distant until it becomes personal and often in the moments of quiet and under cover of darkness, awful things can happen. The scripture that we heard read some moments ago speaks of a confluence of two empires that Matthew tells us about. One of them is very obvious in the court of Herod, an empire with a zip code and an entourage and all of the trappings of that rule. But another that Matthew has been telling us about all along in this gospel that is hidden. It is marked out by ancient prophecies and an invisible spirit. It is, Jesus says, like yeast working its way imperceptibly through the loaf. It is like a dragnet that suddenly reveals what is inside the waters. It is like a treasure that is hidden in a field. It cannot be immediately seen and perceived. And in the middle of all of this, Matthew gives us this scene of Herod, who is a Roman client celebrating his birthday the way that the Romans do. He is celebrating in an exaltation of himself and in an exaltation of his power. And in the middle of this, a prophet of God comes and speaks to the empires of this world with a more ancient word. This is the only scene here in which Jesus is absent but it sets the scene for what will happen later on when Jesus himself is turned over to the powers that be. And John does precisely what Jesus does with Pilate. He speaks in a way that provokes the powers. He points to the truth that one kingdom must fall in order for another kingdom to emerge, another kingdom to rise. And John does this here by speaking a very simple sentence, a very simple reality that provokes the powers in much the way that Jesus often does. He asks seemingly innocent questions or makes seemingly random statements. Where is your husband? Who is your neighbor indeed? whose image is on this coin. And as he speaks, he stirs up in order to perceive and in order to heal. What is happening here in Herod's court is not that different 
from what happens in every generation when the power of life and the cause of the gospel and the larger picture of the kingdom of God confronts those who would seek to wield the sword of death in order to preserve what we want. That does not only happen in Herod's court. That does not only happen in Bonhoeffer's Germany. That does not only happen in abortion clinics dotting this country. This is a confrontation that happens in every single human heart and in every single human life. And notice what happens. When John speaks here, he provokes and he confronts the terror of conscience. When Herod begins to hear about the signs and the miracles that Jesus has been performing, he immediately thinks this is a zombie John the Baptist who has come back to haunt me. There is deep within his conscience a recognition that the life that I have taken, the execution that I have ordered, was not within my power to take. He would have had an entire group of people willing to say to him, you did what you had to do. An entire group of people who were willing to say you were well within your rights to deal with this troubler in Israel or this troubler in the Roman Empire. And yet there was a conscience that spoke to him, a conscience that is addressed in every single generation when this force of death emerges and is present. So often when we think of the issue of sanctity of human life, we assume somehow that abortion clinics are religion-free places, that they are filled with secularists who have come in with secularist dogma. But that is not at all the case. As a matter of fact, several years ago, there was an article written about personnel in an abortion clinic talking about how many of the patients who came in to seek abortions were Roman Catholics and Southern Baptists and said that these Roman Catholic and Southern Baptist girls and women did not come in in any way hiding that reality about themselves. These people said the Roman Catholic women would have rosary beads. The Southern Baptist women would speak about their faith. And the Roman Catholic women would say, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to go to confession. And the Southern Baptist women would say, I know this is wrong, but I prayed to receive Christ and God will forgive me. There was a sense in which there was a working through in the hallway of this clinic, those words that the Apostle Paul has warned us about, let us sin that grace may abound. But why did it come up? It comes up because there is a conscience that is ongoingly speaking. Herod could not escape this. Herod could not walk away from the paralysis of this because the conscience is pointing him toward the light that for every single one of us apart from Christ causes us to flinch and to withdraw and to hide. Where the proclamation of the kingdom of God is, it addresses a conscience that seeks to dehumanize and seeks to run away from the voice that is calling. And unless there is an address to that conscience, there is further hiding, and behind further hiding, there is further rebellion and further sin. The terrors of the conscience are present even at the beginning of this narrative. But John here, by his very presence, speaks to the conscience, but he also stirs up this tyranny of the passions in order to identify it. John comes in, as the scripture tells us, in the spirit of Elijah, confronting another Ahab who seeks to take another man's vineyard and another man's wife, who seeks to grab what does not belong to him. And John stands and speaks and says, it is not lawful for you to have her. What is 
happening with Herod is not that Herod is immediately seeking to act violently for the sake of violence. There is something else that is carrying him along toward violence, and it is passion. It is craving. It is lust. It is what James tells us is the reason we have wars among us, because you want and you do not have. And he'd been hemmed in here, the Scripture says, for a long time by other people's expectations. He was not as violent as he could be because the people assumed John to be a prophet in the same way that those seeking to kill Jesus for a long time did not have him arrested for fear of what would happen among the people. The lust and the passion that he has, it is is there, it is hemmed in, but it is boiling underneath the lid. Many of us are able to submerge because of the consequences that would come for whatever it is that we seek to grasp and whatever it is that we seek to have, it keeps us from giving expression to those things, and we assume, therefore, that those things are gone. The stirring, though, of this passion is not stopping. The ubiquity of the plague of Internet pornography in our own churches speaks to the spiritual reality that happens when there is an attaching to the craving for what one cannot have and the more and the more and the more and the more that one is drawn into that in a way that is destructive of who the person actually is and is meant to be. Herod here sees this woman that he wants. He sees this action that he wants. And as Frederick Beekner once put it, lust here is the craving for salt by a man who is thirsting to death. He thinks that this will solve his problem, that this will answer what it is that he wishes to have, and it leads him into violence. Not every person is enticed as Herod is by a stripper's pole. Many are enticed, as Hitler was, by an Asherah pole, power of ambition. But there is a sense in which whatever it is that attaches itself to the desire, it speaks to a conscience in order to say you cannot have what you want and left to ourselves, all of us seek to do with the word of God what Herod tried to do, to shut its mouth and to silence it. Herod does not want to be told you cannot have what you want. And so instead he seeks by his grip and by his power and by his fury and by his position to silence it and to silence it finally. Herodias here as she dances goes and talks to her mother and says, what, do I, what should I ask for? Herod has offered up to half of my kingdom a promise that Herod himself cannot even grant as a client of Rome. But it feeds further the ego that seeks to be seen as powerful and in control. And what does the mother want? She wants the head of this prophet on a silver platter. This is not because her mother was a collector of body parts of intertestamental prophets. Her mother sought to exercise a kind of power in doing away with the word that is speaking to her, and she thought she could do it. She could get rid of it. She could shut it up. She could cut off its head. The lust and the craving for more led ultimately in the fullness of time to violence. And it always does. That's why we live in a world of abortion clinics and divorce courts and torture chambers. 
because we believe that if we have the power to accomplish our cravings, if we have the power to follow the desires, as Paul says, of the body and of the mind, that somehow we can carry that power all the way through and treat persons as things to be disposed of, even in the way that we speak in distancing terms. Embryo, fetus, object of interrogation, illegal immigrant, Ways that we can somehow find a way to speak of persons as categories to be dealt with rather than those who are bearing an image of God that cannot be disposed of. Verses 11 and 12 are horrifying. Herodias goes to her mother, and then she comes back to Herod, and she asks for the head of Herod on this platter And this prophet, this man that Jesus says is the greatest of all of the prophets, is severed head from body, and his head is thrown away with trash. He is simply something to be disposed of here. It seems to be the triumph of the reign of death. It is In this case, a reason for the disciples of John and the disciples of Jesus to assume that everything is falling apart, that everything is moving into darkness and into chaos, and to wring their hands in fear or to shout with their voices in fury. But just as Matthew tells us she went and told her mother, They went and told Jesus. They went and told Jesus. That seems to be a disappointing end to this story. Jesus frustrates me here in my flesh. He doesn't respond the way that I would want him to respond. I would want Jesus to walk into the court of Herod and with the power of levitation through his hand, rip Herod's head off and say, how do you like me now? To respond with one sort of power with another sort of power, one sort of violence with another sort of violence. But Jesus does no such thing. Jesus hears the message of Herod's death just as he hears the, of John's death, just as he hears the message of Lazarus's death, and he moves on his way. Why? Because he is moving toward the place of the skull. He is moving toward Golgotha. Jesus' path here is connected with the longer path that is present in front of us in this gospel and in the gospel itself. You and I are not going to be able to address the threats to the sanctity of human life that come in our generation as they have come in previous generations if we don't understand what's behind them. And what's behind them is not simply some faulty view of what's happening. What's behind them is not simply a faulty view of human biology. What's behind them is a craving and a grasping, as all of us in our fallen humanity have done, from the bloody path out of Eden onward. And we will never be able to address this ultimately if we understand that the ultimate message cannot simply be come to repentance, although it must be that. The ultimate message is what we see in the telling of Jesus, the pointing toward a gospel that speaks both of justice and of justification, of speaking the truth about sin and the truth about neighbor and the truth about what it means to live in accountability before God along with the message that those who have fallen into the way of violence, that those who have fallen in the path of darkness are welcomed into a gospel that means that when hidden in Christ, the woman who has had the abortion, the man who has paid for the abortion, is not seen as a freak 
or as an outcast is not viewed with the suspicion of someone who has found some kind of a loophole into the kingdom of God, but has already been condemned at the cross of Christ. And so when God sees that woman, when God sees that man, he sees that person exactly as he sees Jesus himself as he emerges from a hole in the ground in the Middle East. This is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. The advocacy for the sake of human life cannot sacrifice speaking openly and honestly to the consciences of our neighbors because those consciences are already awake and alive and terrified. We speak truthfully about what is at stake, and then we also speak, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We speak of a gospel that addresses the sanctity of human life, a gospel that answers all of the ways that our cravings and our lusts have been turned away and redirected from their true home. And we speak with a healthy sense of pessimism that this isn't simply resolved by a few more election cycles but we also speak with the hopeful optimism that is able to pierce through consciences and is able to raise the dead to newness of life. You and I are living in a world of people who are as terrified as Herod. A group of people who like he and like we in our old lives are seeking simply to manage the consequences God has not called us to consequence management. God has called us to be a people who speak of life and of peace and of hope and of kingdom and of gospel in the Holy Spirit. Two kingdoms were there, and all around us is the sound of the collapse of teetering kingdoms. But if you listen behind all of that, There's a severed head that still speaks. Seemed hopeless to look into cold, blood-motted eyes of a head that silently lay there with a mouth that once was a voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the paths of the Lord. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Herod was able to silence the mouth Hitler was able to silence mouth. The powers of every age are able to silence mouths, but the word of God is not chained. The word of God is not arrested, and the word of God cannot be beheaded. Behind the voice that is spoken, there is a threat to the existing order, but that is a provocative mission a dangerous mission, but a mission that brings about not only life, but peace. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Holy Father, we pray right now for all of the ways that we look around even immediately around us and we see neighbors with consciences that are accused. With those who have sought to carry out by their power to gain what they can gain, sometimes, Father, violently so. Father, we think of those who have sought to address the consequences of their lives by shedding innocent blood, by those who are in bondage to using other people as objects, sometimes on screens. Father, we think of those who are around us who are living with an accusation that says there is nothing waiting for you but judgment And sometimes, Father, even in the fury of trying to silence that, 
there seems to be nothing but hostility. And Father, we pray that we would be able to speak not only of truth, but as truth goes forward, ultimately of peace. Father, we pray for congregations filled with ex-abortionists and ex-pornographers and ex-torturers and ex-swindlers and ex-all of the things that we are. And Father, we pray we won't forget that. And we ask this in Jesus' name.